Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference on the special NOFO to address unsheltered and rural homelessness. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the Zoom chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the host. To ask a question at any point during today's presentation, please select everyone from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the box provided and hit enter to send. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Norm Sushar, Director of the SNAPS Office. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. Uh, we're very excited and happy to present information about our new Notice of Funding Opportunity. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick overview and hand things off to the team to uh, walk through the different parts of the webinar. If you have a question, first of all, I appreciate everyone introducing themselves in the chat window. Thank you very much for that. Uh, if you have a question during the webinar, uh, please go ahead and type it into the chat window and uh, please direct those comments to everyone so that uh, we are all able to see it. Uh, and we will do our best to answer as many of those questions either in the chat window or out loud, uh, as many of those questions as we can. Uh, obviously, we will be uh, posting a recording and a transcript of this webinar on the website as soon as we can. Uh, and with that, let's let's dive into the comments, or sorry, into the content. Uh, first of all, I should have introduced myself. I'm Norm Suchar, uh, director of the SNAPS office. Uh, you, we will be hearing from uh, several other snappers today. Uh, Brad Esters, Ebony Rankin, Sid Nilakanta are all going to be presenting. We also have several snappers that are in the background that will be helping to answer questions, uh, so thank you all. Uh, so let me start by uh, giving a broad overview of the NOFO. Uh, so first of all, 322 million is available through this special notice funding opportunity. Uh, of that, 50, almost 55 million is targeted to rural areas uh, and uh, over 267 million is for generally available for unsheltered homelessness. S to apply, a COC will have had to register in the fiscal year 22 uh, registration process. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, project applications have to go through the COC. Uh, so this is the, the competition process will operate much like our regular COC competition process. Uh, so the pro project applications have to be submitted and approved by the COC. They have to be included on a priority listing. All the projects have to be rated and ranked, uh, including, uh, and this is a little different than in the past, uh, COC planning and UFA cost projects also have to be rated and ranked. Uh, the grant terms for these projects will be three years, so that's also different than our uh, usual uh, process. Uh, and the deadline for submitting all applications is October 20th, 2022. Uh, let's move on to our next slide, please. I want to talk through the priorities of the NOFO, and then I'll turn it over to uh, the team for uh, some more details about how the NOFO works. So these are our high level priorities here. The first one should be obvious. The, the purpose of this NOFA is really to address unsheltered homelessness. Uh, and so that's, that's really the focus of this whole endeavor. Uh, we are also focusing on rural areas uh, in a different way than we have in the past. Some of the funding available in this NOFA will be dedicated to rural areas. Uh, Sid, I think we'll talk a little more about how that will work, but I should say we have a webinar tomorrow that is just dedicated to the rural parts of the NOFO, so uh, if you are super interested in the rural uh, aspect of this, you should tune into tomorrow's webinar. Uh, 
We also are very pleased that this NOFO will offer assistance on tribal lands. Uh, we will talk more about that later in this webinar as well, but that's very, very excited, uh, exciting. Uh, we, I also, also should mention that there is a priority in the rural section for underserved areas, and we'll talk a little more about that as well. Uh, we do have a priority on involving a broad array of stakeholders in the COC's efforts to reduce homelessness. Uh, so you'll see that sprinkled throughout the NOFO. Uh, and then there is uh, a, an emphasis on advancing equity, including racial equity, uh, equity with respect to gender identity, disability, sexual orientation, et cetera, uh, in this NOFO. Uh, we also have a, a big emphasis on ensuring that people with lived experience are engaged and involved in the decision making uh, of the COC. Uh, and then while it's last on this list, certainly not last as a priority, uh, we the NOFO uh, in some cases strongly encourages, in some cases, but for the most part requires that communities are using a housing first approach uh, in the in their proposed projects. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Brett, uh, who's going to, she's going to walk through uh, the details of the NOFO. So Brett, over to you. Great, thanks, Norm. Uh, next, yep, yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, as Norm mentioned, there are two uh, separate pots of funding that are being awarded through this NOFO. One we're calling the unsheltered homelessness set aside and one we're calling the rural set aside. We are super creative here in SNAP in our naming conventions. Um, each set aside has a maximum amount of funding um, and each set aside has different selection criteria, both of which we'll go through. The selection criteria we'll talk about later in the webinar. Um, for the unsheltered set aside, the maximum amount that you're allowed to apply for is your fiscal year 2022 PPRN or 60 million, whichever is less. There were only three COCs where 60 million is less, so most of you won't have to worry about that. Projects that are funded through this set aside can serve any geographic area of the COC and we will select them based on COC score. So basically, as you'll hear about later, um, a COC that scores high enough to be selected for funding under this set aside will receive all of their projects up to their maximum award amount. And I saw a question in the chat, this maximum award amount is for the entire three years. So it's not that you get that maximum award amount every year, this maximum amount covers the, all three years, all of your projects for all three years. Under the rural set aside, um, you can apply for 150% of the PPRN of your rural areas. So what we did is for all of the COCs, um, we looked at the rural geography that is part of your COC and took the PPRN associated with that, added it all up and multiplied it by 150%. And that's the maximum amount that you can apply for through the rural set aside. Um, the NOFA, in Appendix A uh, includes all of those maximum amounts that you can apply for. Uh, and the question already came in, you can apply for funding under both set-asides by answering the same question, uh, as you'll see as we go through the criteria. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the selection criteria for the NOFA, so how we're gonna score your application and determine whether your projects will be funded. Um, this competition follows the rules of the COC program. So it, you will see throughout this NOFA that we have the statutory selection criteria for the COC program. On the unsheltered side, the COC the consolidated application is going to be assessed on a 100 point scale. COCs have to receive at least 50% of the points to receive, to be considered for funding. So on the unsheltered homelessness set aside, you have to receive 50 points to be considered for funding. Just because you don't, but just because you get 50 points doesn't mean you will be funded, but that is what you have. That's the floor you have to meet to even be considered. We do expect this to be highly competitive. For the rural set aside, you'll see as we go through, if you are only applying for funds for the rural set aside, there are three fewer questions that you have to answer. And so the maximum score on the rural set aside is 89 points. 
And COCs have to receive at least 44 and a half points to be considered for funding. And again, that doesn't mean that you'll receive funding. It means that, that is the minimum you have to receive to even be considered for funding. Next slide, please. Okay, the selection criteria are broken out into four categories. The first three categories are those statutory selection criteria of the COC program, and they're going to look very, very familiar to you. We have done our best to ensure that these are similar to the questions that are being asked in the annual COC competition, and hopefully we'll reduce some burden in applying to this competition and the COC program competition. They are two separate competitions and very likely they will be operating at the same time. So hopefully what you say in one will be able to help you with another uh, that we can't speak to the COC program NOFA yet. And then the fourth category, this is sort of the meat of this NOFA, this is, or NOFO. This is the COC's plan for serving individuals and families with severe service needs. Um, so ESNAPS is not open yet. Uh, I think it'll be open in probably a couple weeks. But this, this, this section of the NOFA, if you go to the, I think the next slide, um, this section of the NOFA is, is not incorporated into ESNAPS where you select a drop down or you write, fill it in in a text box. This section of the NOFA is entirely an attachment that you fill out in Word or whatever word processing software you use and then attach it on the attachment screen in, in eSnap. So you can start this before the before eSnap is open. And we would encourage you to do so. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a little bit of how you will send this attachment to us and then Ebony will go through the details of what's required in the attachment to meet the scoring criteria. So the attachment, um, it's eight and a half by 11 inch pages, single spacing, half inch margins, 12 point Times New Roman. If you do sub pages, those will be counted as two separate pages, one page per sheet, please. There is no shrinking a page so you can get two pages on a sheet. If you do that, we're gonna count it as however many pages you shrunk to fit on that uh, sheet. Um, please number all of those pages. Um, and there, you'll see when Ebony walks through some of the, the requirements for the selection criteria, there are a few other attachments required in the plan. These separate attachments do not um, count towards the 15 page limit. So actually, let me turn it over to Ebony now to go over what we expect to see in your plan. And then we can ask more questions, answer questions as they come in. Thanks, um, Brett. Next slide. Okay, so um, first, when I go through these slides, you will see uh, the several requirements listed in um, this section. You will see the words required for rule set aside, which means these requirements are required for rule set aside, but they are also required for the unsheltered home, homelessness set aside. So un, unsheltered homelessness set aside have all the requirements and then rules set aside have certain requirements um, that needs to be met. So that's why you will see um, those words um, in the slides. So the first two portions of the COC's plan must describe their ability to leverage mainstream resources. Um, first to provide uh, housing resources and then to provide healthcare resources. So some of the, um, requirements for the housing resources and healthcare resources may look familiar to you from um, if you've applied through the FY 2021 COC program competition. Um, so the first one, leveraging housing resources have two requirements. The first one is to demonstrate the COC's ability to leverage non-ESG and non-COC resources to provide permanent housing. So COCs must attach letters of commitment, contracts, or other formal written documents that clearly demonstrate the number of subsidies or units uh, that are being used to support uh, rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing projects that they're applying for as part of the competition. And to receive four points, the COC must attach a letter of, of commitment from a PHA, uh, Public Housing Authority, in their geographic area committing to working with the COC um, to pair vouchers with COC-funded services 
and to develop a prioritization plan um, for potential allocation of uh, stability vouchers or um, a general preference for general admission to the housing choice voucher program through coordinated entry process. So these, um, these attachments do not count toward the 15 page uh, limit in the narrative. And of course, more information um, on these attachments are in the NOFO. The second requirement is uh, leveraging housing. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the second requirement for leveraging housing resources was, is to demonstrate the COC's current strategy for recruiting landlords and their units um, to utilize uh, tenant-based rental assistance. So this um, part of the narrative response will count towards the 15-page limit because it's not an attachment. It is part of the narrative um, of your current strategy. Um, and then for leveraging healthcare resources, the COC is required to demonstrate um, commitments from healthcare organizations to provide healthcare services to program participants residing in permanent housing. So this will be done by attaching a formal written agreement um, that include the value of the commitment and the dates the healthcare resource will be, be provided. And uh, those attachments for the healthcare resources do not count towards the 15 page limit on a narrative. So next slide. Um, the uh, next requirement for the COC plan, the COCs must demonstrate their current strategy uh, to identify through outreach and provide immediate access to low barrier emergency shelter and low barrier permanent housing to individuals and families experiencing homelessness. So you will see on this slide that COCs who are only applying for funding through the rule set aside are only required to use, to tell us um, their strategy to identify and provide immediate access to lower bar barrier uh, permanent housing. They do not have to demonstrate their strategy for um, providing access to low barrier emergency shelter or temporary housing. Um, and in, in this section, we're looking for communities to show that they have strategies for identifying and engaging everyone, including those with the highest vulnerabilities um, experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And we are looking for communities to tell us about their strategies to provide low barrier, culturally appropriate access to temporary accommodations and permanent housing to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and we are, we are interested in strategies that have been implemented in the recent past and lesson learned from implementing those practices. And when we say re recent past, we do mean within the last three years. All right, next slide. So the final four factors um, of the COC's plan uh, for serving uh, individuals and families with severe service needs, uh, you see those on the screen here. Um, HUD is looking for communities to tell us uh, how they're going to update their strategies that we discussed on the previous slide using data and performance. Um, this question is not required for COCs that are only applying for rules set aside, um, but if you're applying for any of the funds through the unsheltered homelessness set aside, then you must answer this question, the first uh, part um, in your narrative. And the remaining criteria on this slide uh, are required for COCs applying for both set asides. So they are the, um, describing how the COC will prioritize resources awarded under the special NOFO in a way that will contribute to um, reducing unsheltered homelessness. And you will hear later that HUD has not restricted eligibility for permanent supportive housing in the same way we um, normally do in the COC program NOFOs. So prioritization strategy will be particularly important um, the third uh, requirement demonstrating that the COC is involving individuals with lived experience, um, with lived expertise, I'm sorry, of homelessness and decision making of the COC and in service delivery. Um, one thing that's new to communities used to applying for COC funds is that this NOFO adopts, uh, adapts um, a requirement similar to what we have um, in the YHDP. Um, that's the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. To receive full points, COCs will be required to attach a letter from a work group comprised of individuals of lived experience of homelessness that they support this application and uh, projects prioritized for funding in this application. 
and that attachment will not be um, part of your 15 page limit. But those of you who applied through YSGP are familiar with that requirement um, for the Youth Action Board. And then the last requirement um, for the COC plan is demonstrating the extent to which your COC has been able to identify and serve underserved communities and offer um, equitable housing uh, interventions that meet the need of underserved communities. So that is a lot um, and you only have 15 pages to be able um, to put all that uh, um, on paper. Uh, next slide. So the way that um, we will award point, points uh, to COCs um, based on the number of people that was reported on as unsheltered on your 2019 point in time count. And you see the scale for how many points that will be allotted here. You know, 30 points for a thousand or more people, 20 points for 5,000 to um, less than 10,000. I'm sorry, 30 points for 10,000 or more people. Um, 10 points for a thousand to less than 5,000. And then uh, no points for anything fewer than um, 1,000 people. Um, so I will now turn it back over to Brett to discuss more of the selection process. Great, thanks, Ebony. Uh, next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about this in the intro. So for, we're gonna have two separate selection criteria for the two separate pots of money under this NOFA. For the unsheltered homelessness set aside, um, we're going to score your COC application and then award funds to the top scoring COCs. So as I mentioned earlier, a COC that receives funding is going to receive funding for all of its projects within its maximum amount, um, assuming that those projects pass quality thresholds and there are quality thresholds outlined in the NOFA and you should review those closely. Um, because if a project doesn't pass those thresholds, then it won't be funded, even if all of your other projects are. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then on the rural set aside, this is going to look very similar to how we select projects in tier two in the COC competition. So every single project that is submitted on a rural priority listing will be scored on a 100 point scale. Uh, that 100 point scale will be made up of the factors that are on the slide. So it'll be comprised of your COC score, where you as a COC ranked it. And then there is a factor that um, it's called serving structurally disadvantaged areas. Um, and this is if the project makes a commitment to serve individuals and families in geographic areas that have high levels of homelessness, housing distress or poverty. So high levels of need and is located in an area of the COC where COC services have up to now been entirely unavailable. And there will be space in the project application for a project to tell us if their project is going to serve one of these areas. Next slide, please. So as always, um, the NOFA will support geographic diversity. That's important to us. Um, we reserve the right to fund the project, uh, fund projects to a COC if we haven't funded a COC in, it, in at least every region of our geography. Um, but I think the important thing for today is that on the unsheltered homelessness set aside, if more than 10 COCs from a single state qualify for funding through this set aside, then we're only going to fund the 10 highest scoring COCs. After that, we will remove the remaining COCs from the, from the state that would have qualified and keep working our way down the list. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Sid, who's gonna talk about some of the information for the projects that will be coming in under this NOFA. Thank you, Brett. Uh, so under the project applications for, unsheltered, for the unsheltered NOFO, uh, we have the following that are available. The, for under permanent housing, we have uh, PSH and RRH. Uh, we have, also have the joint TH and PHRH component type. What you'll notice is new is the supportive services uh, component type. We now we have three uh, project types. We have the coordinated entry that many of you know, uh, but we also have street outreach and we have standalone SSO. In the project application, you will see this as SSO other. Uh, when you when you fill out an application for a standalone SSO. 
Uh, there's also a component type for HMIS. And then we have um, a separate application for COC planning and for UFA costs. And uh, just to reiterate, both the planning and the UFA costs come out of the unsheltered homeless set aside uh, funding pot. Uh, next slide, please. So eligible costs. Um, under this competition, project applicants will be applying for the same costs as in the normal COC program competition, except hard costs will only be considered in projects applying funding through the rules set aside. Uh, any project application containing requests for a hard cost on the unsheltered homelessness set aside will be rejected. Uh, CUNC planning and UFA costs will only be funded through the unsheltered homeless set aside. And unlike the CUC competition, they must be ranked amid the other projects included in the application for funding in this, uh, in the unsheltered homeless set aside. There will be additional activities that can be applied for through the rural set aside, uh, which we'll we will review briefly next, but we'll cover in more detail on the rural uh, specific webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are a handful of costs uh, that are not traditionally eligible under the COC program uh, for project applicants applying for funding through the rural set aside. They include the costs you see on the screen here. Uh, these costs must be part of a project for one of the components mentioned uh, about a couple of slides ago. For example, an applicant could apply to provide up to six months of utility arrears for program participants in a rapid rehousing project. Uh, and in ESEPs, you'll see these costs listed on the supportive services only screen but uh, for, on the supportive services uh, budget screen, but uh, you'll, we'll, you'll have more information about that at the, again at the rural webinar uh, that is being held tomorrow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, projects awarded under this NOFA will have different program participant eligibility, depending upon whether the project was funded through the unsheltered homeless set aside or the rural set aside. Uh, projects funded through the unsheltered homeless set aside may only serve individuals and families that qualify as homeless under category one or category four. And projects funded through the rural set aside may serve individuals and families that qualify under any of the categories of homelessness. However, to serve category three, the COC must request HUD approval, but must request HUD approval. Instructions for requesting HUD approval can be found in the NOFO. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and there are just a few other requirements that will be expected for projects that are funded through the SNOFO, some of which will look very familiar and some of which are very specific to the SNOFO. Uh, first, uh, as has been mentioned before, all projects awarded under the SNOFO must adopt and follow a housing first approach. Uh, second, all projects must pass eligibility and quality thresholds outlined in the NOFO to be considered for funding. HUD will reject any projects that do not meet these thresholds. So again, that's something that's very familiar uh, to the CSC program. And finally, all project applicants must demonstrate how their project will be consistent with the plan for serving individuals and families experiencing homelessness with severe service needs uh, that Ebony had discussed uh, earlier. There will be a text box in the project application need stamps for applicants to provide this description um, to, to state how this uh, project application is uh, consistent with the plan. Uh, one thing I would like to mention um, before we get to the end of this, the slides is, in ESAPs, the unsheltered set aside and rural set aside are two separate applications. Uh, and so if you apply for the wrong application, you, you will know pretty quickly that you are under the wrong application and will be asked to uh, apply under the correct application. Same with the COC planning and UFA, UFA costs will have their own separate application. So essentially there are four project applications under this uh, NOFO. There's the under, a project up under this NOFO. So it's the unsheltered set aside, the rural set aside, there's uh, planning and the UFA costs. Uh, next slide, please. And these are some resources that we have. Uh, we have this a, a specific COC special NOFA webpage, uh, and we have a specific uh, COC no, uh, special COC NOFA uh, email address. Uh, so this is different than the COC address. Uh, so please remember if you want to ask questions about if you have questions about the this the unsheltered NOFO, to send it to this specific uh, email address. And I think with that, that's uh, those are my slides, and we've come to the end of the PowerPoint presentation. And I think we are now open for questions. Great, uh, thank you so much, everyone. I know we covered a lot of content here, so uh, and we have a ton of questions. So we're just going to plow through things. Uh, just one quick note about this, we will be posting 
both the video of this, we will also be posting a transcript. So if we all went too fast, you'll be able to go back and read through the transcript. We will also post the chat box uh, so you can see the written questions and our written responses to those questions. So everything that's covered here will be available in a, in, in a format you can sort of uh, thoughtfully go over. Uh, and we will get that up as soon as we can, uh, but I just wanted to let everyone know. There were a couple technical questions I wanna go through very quickly. One is we will have detailed instructions available for this. We will, we're working on those, we'll post them as soon as we can. Uh, e we, people will be applying in eSnaps, as Sid mentioned. Uh, eSnaps is not open for this yet, but as Brett mentioned, it's worth starting to work on your uh, plan, which will just be simply uploaded as an attachment. So you don't really need eSnaps uh, for that. Uh, so, but detailed instructions will be available. Um, I want to talk in a little more detail about the overlap between the, the timing of this NOFO and the timing of the regular COC NOFO. Uh, so this special NOFO is only for new projects. Uh, there are no renewals being funded under this NOFO. Uh, we will also have a regular COC competition that covers renewals and new projects and all the things you've gotten used to over the past few years. That will open sometime soon. Uh, it won't be next week. I don't know the exact timing, uh, but uh, sometime in the coming weeks that will open. It will also likely close before this special NOFO closes. So we completely understand that that's not the greatest way to have the timing of all this work out. Unfortunately, uh, that's where we ended up and I'm very much sorry about that. So there will be a lot of work over the next uh, few months for you all. Um, so I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that. Uh, there are there was there were some questions about the three year uh, app, the the three year grants and what all that means with respect to the maximum funding amount. So let me walk through that very uh, carefully here. If you go to Appendix A and you see that your community is eligible for three million dollars, uh, what that means is that three million dollars is the total three year grant for which your community is eligible for, or three-year sets of grants. So that's, that roughly translates into a million a year. It actually precisely translates into a million a year. Uh, and when those projects come in for renewal, they'll, they'll be eligible for a million dollars you know, with the FMR adjustments. Uh, so what that all means is what you're seeing in that appendix is that is a three-year total of funding. We also have a whole bunch of questions about if you're in a rural area, can you apply for both the rural and uh, unsheltered portion of this? Uh, so let me walk through that as well. The short answer is yes. If you are in a rural area, you can submit applications under both the unsheltered portion and the rural portion. They have to be separate projects. You cannot submit the same project under both. Uh, so these would be separate projects, uh, but you can get funded under both as well. So theoretically, if in Appendix A, your COC has $3 million and in Appendix B, it has a million dollars, you could have, you could potentially be awarded $4 million total. Uh, so that, that sort of hopefully gives you a sense of how uh, that part works. Um, I'm going to walk through a few more detailed questions here. Uh, and first of all, let me just say thank you so much, everyone, for uh, people have submitted fantastic questions here. Uh, one question, and um, uh, Brett, I think I'll turn this over to you. Uh, the question is about Medicaid and can the state Medicaid agency be considered a healthcare resource partner? Uh, can you talk about that, please? Sure. Um, yes. If you are able to find a way to work with your uh, state Medicaid agency to get a commitment to, uh, sorry, to sort of partner some of it, what it funds with your project, then that would be, that could be counted towards the points for leveraging healthcare resources. 
really here we're looking for any contribution from any sort of healthcare organization um, for providing funding, health insurance, uh, assistance applying for health insurance, providing healthcare services, so in kind services. Um, any of those types of activities can count uh, towards those points that are mentioned in uh, the plan. Uh, you just have to be able to document through them through a written agreement and attach those to your NOFA and it has to include the value of the commitment and the dates that those resources will be provided so that we can um, calculate your points correctly. So that is very well said and I would just uh... Uh, amplify that, uh, which is to say, we very much encourage you to work with your state Medicaid agency on this. Uh, we think that's a really important partnership. So, uh, you know, big thumbs up if that's what your plan is. Uh, we also had a question about the 30 point bonus for, um, for having a lot of unsheltered people in your continuum of care. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the purpose of that and also want to clarify what it means a little more precisely because I think there's, uh, well, I just want to clarify there. So we very much wanted to make sure that this uh, resource was targeted to places with a lot of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way our statutes and uh, regulations are written, we didn't have a ton of options for how to do that. Uh, this seemed to be the most direct and straightforward way to make sure resources were targeted to those areas. Uh, so that's what we went with. I, I should also say that this is this is bonus. These are bonus points. So the the NOFA is still worth for the unsheltered NOFA is still worth a hundred points. Uh, and if you and these bonus points would be on top of that potential hundred points. So theoretically, a a uh, continuum of care could actually score above 100 points. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think a lot of people were talking about, well, if these 30 points are taken out of the picture, they're starting from a 70 point place. Uh, you're actually really starting, still starting from a 100 point place. Uh, it's just that these could be considered on top of your regular, uh, regular points. Uh, so, Brett, I'm going to throw this next question your way as well. This is about PSH projects where the project application does not have, uh, uh, is not requesting rental assistance. Uh, so the question is, can we include a PSH project without rental assistance or leasing to couple with incremental vouchers as part of this solicitation? Yes, um, in fact, great that you are able to bring other housing resources to the table. Uh, just a couple of things to keep in mind. If that's the case, if you have dedicated housing resources, so either you have vouchers or you own a building or those are probably the big ones, um, and you're only requesting funding for supportive services and HMIS or admin or any of those, just make sure you want to select PH, PSH, uh, you are not a a supportive services only project, and you want to be very clear in your application that you have other housing resources. Um, so you just, you just want to be able to demonstrate up to us, probably in the project detail text box that's in the application, that you have those other housing resources. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we and again, I echo and amplify uh, Brett's comments. That's a great approach to take, and uh, we hope you all are successful in, in uh, getting those resources. Uh, we have a question um, about uh, the non-traditional eligible activities in the rural set aside, uh, and whether those are eligible to be renewed in the COC competition when that comes up. Uh, I will just start with a caveat that, like, we can't commit to exactly what's going to be in a future NOFO, uh, but yes, those uh, activities will be renewable. Uh, so we're talking in that case uh, about the special activities that I think Sid talked about and that we'll be discussing way more uh, in tomorrow's webinar. Um, we have another question about, uh, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Sorry, I thought I had a question teed up and then realized I'd already asked it. 
Um, we have two questions I want to address. Um, uh, uh, Ebony, I wonder if you could take this first one about the rating and ranking process. Uh, the, the question is, given that this is a new NOFO, should applica applications be reviewed or ranked using the new applicant guidelines or renewal applicant uh, scoring that uh, COCs typically use in their annual COC process? Yeah, so we do have um, information on the rating and ranking in the NOFO itself. Um, and so the we have um, what we use as our threshold review. So you would be able to, um, uh, so Norm, the question was, are, are they using rating and ranking versus on a new process for new projects? Yeah, I think, I think the, in that person's uh, continuum of care, they probably have a different review process for renewal projects versus new projects, uh, I'm guessing. Um, so I think they're asking about whether they should think about these as more like renewal projects or more like new projects in that review process. Yeah, they, they should think about these more as uh, new projects in that process, because this, we're requiring these projects to be new pro projects anyway, projects that have not received COC funding. I think that was a question as well. Um, so that's the, that's the way you want to think about this when you're looking at your rating and ranking these projects. Great, thank you. Uh, we have uh, about 14 questions about match. Uh, Brett, do you mind uh, jumping in with the match requirements for these funds? Sure, we kind of glossed over this uh, at the beginning, but this all the projects awarded under this the SNOFA will follow the requirements of the COC program. So that means the match requirements will under the COC program will apply to these grants. So that's 25% of all of the budget line items except for leasing, each project will have to match. Um, there was also another question about whether you have to use HMIS. Yes, you have to use HMIS for these projects. All of the requirements that apply to your normal COC projects will apply to these projects as well. Great, thank you. Um, we did also have several comments, I would say, more so than questions about, uh, is it even worth applying if you have less, fewer than a thousand people in your, uh, unsheltered people in your 2019 point in time count? Uh, so, you know, obviously the decision about whether to apply or not is, is the decision you'll have to make. I will say we ran several simulations on this as we were developing the NOFO to see like what would the impact look like uh, for, you know, different kinds of communities. And in all the simulations we ran, there were uh, definitely uh, COCs with fewer than a thousand unsheltered people who did receive funds. Uh, so, you know, if, if your question is, is there any chance of getting funded? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, but again, the question about whether you want to apply or not is obviously, uh, you know, uh, your, your community will have to make a decision about that. Uh, but we'd encourage you to apply. Um, so uh, let's see if we have any other questions here. <clears throat> Can I uh, uh, just add something to that, Norm? Yep. Those bonus points. Because uh, I just see some questions in the chat. Those bonus points only apply to the scoring criteria for the unsheltered homelessness set aside. So those bonus points are only how we're going to select projects under the unsheltered homelessness set aside. We know that rural areas don't see those types of numbers. And so those bonus points don't apply for projects underneath the rural set aside. For the rural set aside, the selection criteria is literally that 100 points per project where 50 are the COC score, I forget, but I think 30, 40 are the, where, how it's ranked, and then 10 is that underserved uh, areas of the COC that have high needs. So those bonus points are not for the rural set aside. I just saw some chatter in the chat, so that'd be helpful. Yep, uh, very great, cl good clarification, thank you. Um, so uh, Brett, while you're here, I, we have a great question about it, whether landlord engagement and housing navigation services would be considered a standalone SSO. Uh, can you talk about that, please? Sure. I, I think it's going to depend on how you set up your projects, right? So 
you may have a recipient who as part of their COC project chooses to do landlord engagement as part of their project, or, and in that case, you would fit it under the supportive service budget line item of that project. Or we have seen a lot of COCs sort of wanna centralize that landlord recruitment and landlord engagement and housing navigation um, at the COC level, in which case they're not providing the housing, they're not providing the ongoing rental assistance. Basically they're helping someone find the unit and then the project that will be providing their ongoing rental assistance will take over. Um, and in that case, it would make a lot of sense for those housing navigation services to be a standalone SSO that you apply for as part of this competition. Great, thank you. Uh, Sid, we also had a question about, um, if, uh, the, and the question came in is, if we're a balance of state COC, uh, can we apply f more than once under this NOFO? Uh, the answer is no, you just submit one application. But for people who are uh, applying for both the unsheltered and rural portion of this, can you talk about how that, wor how that submission will work in eSNAPS? Yes. Uh, so when you apply for the project under for unsheltered or rural, you will register from the funding opportunity in eSNAPS. Um, so if if you if you register for a COC, you know, for the project application in the COC program, you have to register for either a renewal or a new project when you register, you know, when you're trying to register your renewal project or your new project. So it would be the same, same thing that would be happening with the unsheltered NOFO is that if you want to register for an unsheltered project, you register for the, it would say unsheltered set aside funding opportunity. And same with the rule, it will say rule set aside. So that's, as Brett said, we're very creative. That's how it's uh, the naming convention is and how you'll find the funding registration to register for in ESAP. So once you register for that funding, funding opportunity, then you can create a project that falls under the unsheltered uh, funding opportunity or the rural set aside and then uh, the applications are designed specifically for those uh, funding opportunities. So they are different. Uh, so just make sure that you are applying under the right one, uh, depending on, you know, if you're trying to apply for a rural project or a unsheltered set aside project. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we did have, a, we have a couple questions about the vouchers uh, and uh, working with PHA. So I want to uh, answer as much of that topic as I can. So there is reference to stability vouchers in the NOFO. Uh, we don't have a lot more details about this right now. Uh, HUD is working on a notice that will describe in more detail how those vouchers will be allocated, and we expect that notice to come out this uh, later this summer. Uh, so that that is on its way. Uh, and again, that will describe in more detail how that set of vouchers will be allocated. But I do want to uh, emphasize that the PHA questions and the housing leveraging questions are not just limited to the stability vouchers. Uh, we're encouraging uh, you all to leverage every housing resource that you can, uh, either through your public housing agencies or through local rental assistance, multifamily housing, any, basically any housing resources uh, that are available, uh, you know, are going to be eligible for those leveraging questions. Uh, and so we'd encourage you to think bigger than just the, uh, the, the stability vouchers. But with respect to those stability vouchers, HUD will be publishing a notice and uh, it will come out later this year. Uh, we also had a question about uh, about whether when you're talking about uh, uh, commitments with PHAs, whether uh, is it one PHA or all your PHAs. Uh, one thing I want to sort of emphasize is that the commitments, they're sort of like the scoring uh, takes into account the value of the commitments. In some communities that's going to, or some COCs, that's going to uh, involve like just entirely working with one PHA, or it may involve working with several PHAs. Uh, we're not so concerned about the um, number of PHAs as the value of the commitments there. Uh, so, you know, 
I guess uh, I'd suggest working with the biggest ones, but uh, you can decide how best to uh, approach that. Um, let's see, other questions. Uh, so let's see, who should I send this to? Brett, I wonder if you can uh, take this one. Uh, it's a great question about use, can this funding be used in conjunction with home ARP funded projects? Sure. Um, so, uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, so if you are able to use particularly some of the home art funds to build housing and then you're able to go there, hang on, I have a squirrel on my deck. Um, okay, try again. Um, we do know though, so if you're thinking about using C, the, the tricky thing is with using COC with home funding is that there are times so in using both programs, you have to be able to meet both program requirements. And so this has become particularly challenging when trying to stitch together in particular COC funded rapid rehousing with home tenant based rental assistance. And this becomes a problem because we require monthly case management and home requires that no services can be required. So you're not going to be able to stitch together rapid rehousing, most likely in a project. Um, but there certainly may be ways if you are able to stitch together funding for their uh, rental housing and use it as permanent supportive housing, since there are no service requirements for PSH, um, that you might be able to do that. So if you have specific questions, certainly submit it uh, to our, our desk that's on the, on the slide, and we can look at them that way. That's probably easier. Great, thank you. Um, we do also, and uh, Brett, I'm gonna send this question your way also. Uh, we have a question that was answered in the chat, but I, I think it's worth talking about here about whether all the projects submitted in this NOFO have to serve people, exclusively serve people who are uh, unsheltered uh, or people with a history of unsheltered homelessness. Uh, can you talk about what the projects will require and how we're rating uh, all this stuff? Sure. Um, so, no, the projects do not have to serve people who are coming directly from um, an unsheltered location or who have a history of unsheltered homelessness. Uh, however, uh, well, let me back up. For the unsheltered set aside, a project can serve anyone who qualifies um, under category one or category four of our definition of homelessness. Uh, and under the rural set aside, it can serve any of the categories, any of the four categories of our definition, except to serve category three, you need HUD approval. And there are instructions in the NOFA about how to obtain HUD approval if that interests you. However, uh, as Norm mentioned early on, the goal of this NOVA is to reduce unsheltered homelessness, and it is to reduce homelessness amongst individuals and families with severe service needs. And uh, so every COC, that plan we talked about, they have to put together their plan for how they're going to serve individuals with severe service needs, individuals and families. And every project then has to be consistent with that plan. And that is a threshold criteria. So while your project does not necessarily have to serve people coming directly from unsheltered locations, it should be related to your COC strategy for reducing unsheltered homelessness amongst their geographic area. Uh, would you add anything to that, Norm? I think you said that perfectly. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, well, I think you just said that very well. Thank you. Um, we had a question, uh, and Sid, I'm going to uh, send this one over to you also. Um, we had a question about whether COCs can uh, do this application and their regular COC NOFO application concurrently. Can you talk about how that's going to work? Uh, and I, I think, you know, there's probably a, a submission aspect to this question with respect to what happens in eSnaps. Uh, 
can you can you start there uh, with how that's going to work with the regular COC competition submission? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so the when I described before about funding opportunities and eSnaps, this is how we kind of split apart the different nofos from each other. So as an example, YHDP is currently undergoing the the, the round four and five YHDP. Uh, demonstration pro program is currently under uh, having projects being submitted at this time. Uh, and they submitted using the YCP funding opportunity. So it is split differently from the COC funding opportunity. So when the COC competition is going on at the same, at possibly the same time as the unsheltered competition, you're going to have separate funding opportunities happening in ESNAP. So uh, to know that you are you are registering your project on the correct funding opportunity, you need to make sure that uh, for unsheltered that you're look that the funding opportunity says that it's it's either un the unsheltered set aside or the rural set aside. And when it comes to like the planning and UFA cost application, it's going to say I believe like the unsheltered CUC, unsheltered planning and unsheltered UFA. Uh, so you're going to see unsheltered in the name for at least three out of those four funding opportunities, and then rural set aside will be the fourth funding opportunity. So that's how you'll know the difference between that and COC, and then COC will have its own funding opportunity being, uh, you know, COC renewal, uh, new planning and UFA, but there will be no uh, unsheltered moniker attached to it or rural set aside attached to it. And that's how you'll know the difference between the two. Great, thank you. Uh, the other thing I'll say though, is that um, in the sort of your local process for doing the, the application process, um, you know, you may find efficiencies for how to sort of combine the processes and those are all fine. Uh, we don't feel like, you know, if, if you can figure out a way, for example, to co consolidate the local competition, part, then that's fine. There are going to be, to be very blunt about this, there are going to be questions that are exactly the same uh, on the regular COC application. We do, and the this special uh, application, we do have some rating factors that are required by statute. And so we have to, you know, essentially use the same uh, rating factor in both competitions. Uh, if you give us the same response in both, it, like, you know, that may make sense. Uh, you know, we'd ask you to consider the context and everything, but um, you know, it may make sense in that context. Uh, so I want to take. Uh, I want to ask a couple of uh, uh, respond to a couple other questions that have come in in the uh, chat. One is about reporting requirements. Uh, the if you didn't notice, there is actually a quarterly reporting requirement here. Uh, so we will be, we will obviously have more information for those uh, communities that get funded under this application, uh, but there will be a quarterly progress report that project applications will be submitting. Um, so that will look very much like the uh, regular annual performance report, but obviously submitted quarterly. Uh, we also had a question about which system performance measures will be, will be uh, uh, considered here. Uh, and and Brett literally just answered this in the chat window. Well done, Brett. Uh, but as you can see, the answer is we will be using the fiscal year 2021 system performance measures that uh, communities just submitted earlier this year. We will be comparing those to the fiscal year 19 performance measure data. Uh, just one quick note about why 21 and, and 19. Uh, the fiscal year 20 performance measure data was pretty dramatically affected by uh, by COVID and CARES Act and, and various other things. And uh, the numbers were, you know, a little all over the place. Uh, it's the same reason we didn't really consider a lot of those uh, measures or reduce the emphasis on those measures in the 2021 COC application. Uh, so that's why we're comparing 2021 to 2019. Um, and again, those have already been submitted. So uh, we do already have those measures. Um, so we did have some question about like resource pages and things like that. Uh, I, I did wanna, uh, we do have a sort of uh, the link here, but um, Brad, I wonder if you could talk about what resources uh, give people a flavor of what kinds of resources are available 
on that uh, special NOFO page? Sure. Um, so on that, the special NOFO page that is on the slide is where we will kind of house everything related to this competition. It's where this webinar will go. It's where tomorrow's webinar will go. Um, there's already, if you take a look at that um, website, there's already a host of uh, TA materials that are already available. So we, before we published the NOFA, we went through and sort of took a look at everything we've been putting out over the last uh, three years um, at, at the resources that our other federal partners have been putting out. And so you have links um, to those resources on the slide to help you put together your application, to help you develop projects. We released a uh, a resource roundup, I don't remember if that was the name of it, through our listserv the other day, um, including a lot of these resources. I recommend you hang on to that email um, as you're filling out this application and working through this application and thinking about how to implement your projects even after the projects have been awarded. There were a lot of great resources in there. Um, we'll be putting out um, listserv messages over the course of the next several months that will um, provide more resources and more information about the topics that are in the NOFA um, to help you put together your strategies. And our hope is to host a few more um, webinars to be able to answer questions as we go through the process of you all applying for these funds. Great, thank you. Um, so we also had a question about, or a com I guess comment and question about uh, if there will be no, um, no, it, it, we, we won't award more than 10, 10 COCs in any particular state. Uh, what happens with the funding for the 11th, 12th, 13th, et cetera, uh, continuum of care that, that gets funded? Uh, the answer is that, uh, and is there any other sort of geographic diversity uh, um, sort of criteria here? Uh, we do not anticipate any applying any other geographic diversity uh, criteria here. Um, the what happens is if uh, once a state uh, has ten awardees, then we just sort of cross out any the the eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth from that state, uh, and somebody else uh, sort of slides up into a funded position. Um, so pr we we treat it uh, pretty straightforward. And yes, the max of 10 awards is for both uh, unsheltered and rural. So that means that a state could get, for example, seven under seven COCs could be awarded under unsheltered, three separate COCs could be awarded under uh, rural. Um, theoretically, one uh, COC could be awarded under both, and that would not count as two separate awards. That would just count as one. Um, so that's that's the way we're handling that. Um, we had a question about uh, and um, Brett, I wonder if you can take this one about the difference between coordinated entry and street outreach, uh, particularly now that we're funding um, supportive services only grants. Can you talk about like when should people be applying for a coordinated entry grant related to street outreach? And when should somebody apl be applying for a street outreach grant? Uh, and I know it's it can be a fuzzy line, but can you talk about sort of how people should think about that? Yep. Um, okay, so street outreach, we haven't funded uh, outside of coordinated entry, we haven't funded standalone street outreach projects for a while. So, um, for a coordinated entry grant, all of the activities have to be directly related to carrying out your coordinated entry process. So I know a lot of you have um, outreach workers who, or you have people who go out with outreach teams who can conduct, let's say the assessment in the field where someone is sleeping under the bridge in their tent. Um, and so if you wanna fund that process through your coordinated entry grant, that would make a lot of sense. Um, maybe you have software that enables them to take that software out to the field and do the assessment in the field, and then it automatically uploads into whatever system you're using for coordinated entry. That would make sense to go with your coordinated entry grant. If you have a street outreach worker who is um, 
sort of going out and doing just traditional street outreach activities. They're going out, they're attempting to engage, they're providing, they're meeting emergency needs, they're attempting to get somebody to be, want to do the assessment, to want to apply for housing. Those types of costs would go under a street mm -hmm. outreach grant and not your coordinated entry grant. Thank you. Um, we have a question about GIWs. Ebony, I wonder if I could send this your way. Um, so can you talk about, somebody was uh, pointing out that they have an error in their GIW. Uh, they're obviously going to send in a correction. Uh, will that change the amount they're available to apply for under this NOFO? Um, it may well change was available under this NOFO. So just send, uh, we are using uh, PP, your PPRN. Um, so send in your, the GIW has, uh, includes the ARD. Um, actually, no, Norm, I wanna correct that. It does not because we're using PPRN for this. So sorry about that, uh, but still send in your GIW correction. <laughs> Yes, please, please send in the that correction. Sorry. I was just, I just got mixed up there, but yes, no, it doesn't because we're using PPRN for this, um, and the GIW contains the ARD. So, uh, but just send in your correction if you have a correction anyway. Great, uh, and the GIW will affect your regular COC NOFO. Uh, it could very well affect the amount you are, uh, you can apply for through that NOFO. So. Uh, as Ebony said, please, please uh, go ahead and send that in. Um, let's see. Uh, we had another question that I wanted to get to here about um, uh, So we have a question about new SSO projects serving existing housing or shelter projects. We also had several questions, I will say. So Brett, I'm gonna ask this of you and I realize the answer is actually a pretty long and complicated one here, but uh, people have asked whether shelter providers are eligible to apply for funding. Uh, and then we have a question here about whether you can provide supportive services only in a shelter context or in existing housing projects. and can you talk about where the lines are here uh, and sort of help our audience understand what kinds of projects they can apply for, especially under the, the supportive service only category and, and what they still cannot apply for? Sure. Um, okay, so to start, the eligible applicants for funding are those that are traditionally eligible under the COC program. So we're talking nonprofits, state, local governments, PHAs, tribes, EDHEs. So if you are a shelter provider who is also a nonprofit organization, then you would be eligible to apply for funding under this NOFA. Uh, with one exception, and we should probably review that in more detail tomorrow, you cannot use funds under this NOFA to uh, operate emergency shelters. Um, and you can't use them to pay for beds in emergency shelters. There is a special rural activity that we'll talk about more tomorrow um, that does allow you to pay for emergency sheltering. But in general, your project cannot do operations of an emergency shelter um, or any of that kind of stuff. You could fund a project that did supportive that provided supportive services to individuals and families who happen to be staying in emergency shelters. So you could help with housing navigation, for example, for people who are staying in emergency shelters. Um, we've certainly seen in the olden days some of our SSO projects did drop-in centers, and they they set up through an SSO grant. Uh, like a space that offered a variety of services to people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. An SSO project is a project that serves people experiencing homelessness who you're not otherwise providing housing or housing service, how, that you're not otherwise providing housing to. Um, so sort of anything within that framework you could provide to anyone who's experiencing homelessness in, in the categories. Now for unsheltered, it has to be category one or category four. Great, thank you. 
we had some questions about, uh, and Ebony, I'm going to sort of send this your way, about uh, tribal areas and being able to apply for a project serving a tribal area. Uh, and if I didn't clarify before, or we didn't clarify before, tribal areas, we can you can both uh, uh, apply for a project that serves the tribal areas and also tribal uh, tribes and tribally designated housing entities are eligible applicants for projects. Uh, so, you know, both those things are true here. Um, but there, there is a registration requirement uh, and that, so, so Ebony, can you talk about if a tribe uh, is not, did not, was not included, if a tribal land was not included in a COC registration, would they be able to apply, would a project be able to apply for funds under this NOFO to serve that area? So yeah, they will still need to have a tribal resolution um, in a way that the tribal government would express the fact that they will um, be covered under the COC. Uh, and uh, that tribal resolution, I think the registration process is probably closed. So that tribal resolution okay. would have had to already uh, uh, sort of been submitted as part of COC registration. But the thing I want to say about this is if, if you're not sure or you have questions about that, that is a perfect example of a question that you should submit to the uh, questions box that you see on your screen. Uh, and we can sort of help track down uh, what is, you know, what the, what the status of that is. Uh, so again, special COC NOFO at HUD.gov uh, on the screen. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, we had a few questions about the project uh, grant agreement dates and operating start dates and such. Uh, so this is kind of uh, a little sticky, but I want to talk, we don't have, we do have a, Sid, can you talk about the question in the project application? I don't think anybody sees this yet because we haven't opened the system yet, but can you talk about uh, what they'll be expected to provide information on with respect to their start date when they uh, submit their uh, project application? So there really isn't much to place in the project application about your start date. It's more of, will you get your pro like, I think there's a couple of questions asking of, will your project be under granting agreement by a certain time? Um, you can put in, there are, there is areas where you can put in a estimated project start date, but there's nothing that is, uh, how do I say is, um, kind of like guaranteeing that you will start on this date and end on this date. So, uh, that doesn't really happen until post-award where you're, you know, you're putting in those dates, like you're guaranteeing those dates in a way. Uh, at application, it's more of like an estimated project start date and, and a testing that you will get be under grant agreement by a certain time. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a great question and Brett, I wonder if you could talk about this, about HMIS in this application, uh, unsheltered application. So uh, if somebody wants to expand the HMIS or apply for an HMIS grant in this project, uh, in this application, uh, can they just apply for a regular HMIS grant or does it need to have a special focus and tie into the uh, other parts of the their uh, application? Yep, so similar to what uh, we just talked about with coordinated entry, anything you apply for to expand or to add to your HMIS's capacity under this NOFA would have to be related to your, um, your series plan for serving individuals and families with severe service needs. So again, if you want to be able to connect street outreach workers to HMIS in the field um, or to provide more licenses to street outreach workers or to provide more licenses to the providers that are being funded under this NOFA, then that would be an eligible cost under this NOFA. But if you're just looking to expand your general HMIS capacity that has no relationship to the plan or the projects funded under this NOFA, that would not be eligible. And again, Great. in that project application, when you're able to see it, 
there will be a text box that text box that says describe how this project is consistent with the plan and that is where you will tell us that information crystally clear it should be clear in the other parts of your application too but you'll be able to clearly tell us there yeah and I just want to reiterate that if you are uh, in your project application description, uh, you know, again, eSnaps isn't open yet, so you can't see this, but we, well, actually, Sid, can you talk about what should they be putting in their project application description uh, to show that they're connecting with the, the, the plan that Brett just talked about? So there will be a specific question. I'm not sure. I think it's on screen. It'll be on like on the near the project description, either screen, I think on screen 3B or maybe screen 3A, uh, where you just kind of describe how this pro it'll be a text box where you just describe how this project will um, coordinate with the plan that has that you have that the COC has written up. Uh, it, it does, I mean, we would love to have as detailed as, as a description as you can give, um, but just say, just say connection of like how where this project finds itself within the plan that you have written you spent about 15 pages writing up on uh so if you can reference places in the in the plan or uh specific sections that you think this project would would uh work integrate into that's what we'd be probably be looking for great thank you uh, we had a question about uh, whether a tribe or tribally designated housing entity can serve uh, people off that are not located on tribal lands. Uh, and the answer is definitely yes. Uh, so um, in, we definitely encourage tribes and tribally designated housing entities uh, to apply. Um, there was also a question, and Sid, I'm going to send this one to you as well, about project application budgets. Uh, the question is, since they are, uh, and Ebony, thank you for already answered, uh, the, since people are applying for three-year grants, should their project application budget reflect three years of funding? Uh, can you just sort of explain how these project application budgets are going to look? Yes. Uh, so all since all unsheltered set-aside and rural set-aside projects will be on a three-year grant term, that means your projects will be automatically set to three years and the projects you apply for will then, so if you apply for a supportive services, it's gonna split up your, it essentially is taking the money that you are requesting and, and breaking up into three years, but on the summary budget, it's just gonna, if you say you wanna apply for, if you're thinking you're gonna apply for, you wanna, how do I say this? If you are, Believing that you want to you want to apply for a total of a hundred thousand in supportive service dollars over uh, for a three year grant term, uh, if you put a hundred thousand on the summary budget for supportive services, it's not going to multiply by three. It's going to be the the total. So just make sure that you are requesting the the total amount of funds that you want uh, and that it it's um, you're you're requesting the amount. It's almost like when you are applying for a multi term project in uh, the CUC, in the CUC project application. That's how the pro budget's gonna work. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question about whether people should submit their GIW changes to this NOFO mailbox. Uh, you should not. Uh, you should go through the process that we described in the listserv message, uh, but not submit it to this mailbox. Um, we have a question about like about rural projects and what areas they cover. So Brett, if I could send this one over to you as well. So the question is, if you're applying for a project that serves both rural and non-rural geographic areas, can you still apply for it under the rural set aside? Yep, I just actually had plus the answer in the chat, but we can talk through that. Uh, so if your project is going to serve both rural and non-rural areas, that project needs to be placed applied for through the unsheltered homelessness set aside and placed on the project listing for the unsheltered homelessness set aside. Projects that are on the rural set aside can only serve areas that are defined as rural in the NOFO. Um, and in the project application, I can't remember if Sid touched on this or not, there you will select the rural areas that that project is going to serve. And there is no option for you to be able to select a non-rural area. Correct. Great, thank you. Uh, 
Um, we have a question about FMR, uh, FMR levels. Uh, so I want to talk through this a little bit because this is a little complicated. Um, so we, as you know, we are in fiscal year 2022. So everyone's operating under fiscal year 2022 um, fair market rents. Uh, we, this application closes on October 20th, which is in fiscal year 2023. Uh, and our, we require that we use the uh, fair market rents that are, um, are in place at the time the application closes. So when we actually award funds, we will be awarding them based on the fiscal year 2023 FMRs. Uh, but the maximum award amounts are still the same here. So I want to walk through an example here to so you are aware of how this is going to work. Um, if you uh, apply, let's say you're, you're eligible for up to $3 million, you apply for $3 million, uh, and then your FMR goes up by, uh, let's say, 10% between 2022 and 2023, uh, you will still only be eligible to receive up to $3 million, uh, but the project budgets will be adjusted to reflect the, the updated FMRs. So those budget lines will be uh, increased by that 10% amount. And we know, I know that it, you know, bedroom sizes all factor into it and all that stuff, but we'll, we'll make those adjustments. So you may sort of apply for the correct amount, but not get all those projects funded because the FMR increase in your community. Uh, sort of eats into some of that uh, amount. Um, so the other part of that question is which, and that will be the amount for all three years. There will not be a sort of 2024 or 2025 adjustment. Uh, when it goes into renewal, then there will be a fairly large adjustment at that point uh, or an accumulated adjustment at that point, uh, but there will not be sort of mid grant term adjustments. When you're looking at which FMRs you use for a particular individual or household that you're serving, you always use the FMRs that are in place at the time. So if you're serving someone in fiscal year 2024, you are, uh, you, you can, you are using in your calculations the fiscal year 2024 uh, FMRs. Uh, now, obviously, in the COC program, a lot of rental assistance is provided through uh, rent, the rent reasonable standard, uh, but just wanted to sort of make those distinctions and explain how we're treating those uh, FMRs in the competition. Um, so great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, <clears throat> uh, two, 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 I'm sorry, I, anytime I answer a question, I forget to tee up the next question. Uh, Sid, great question about SAM registration. Does your SAM registration have to be current or up to date to apply for this NOFO opportunity? Yes, you need to be current. So please take a look at your SAM, go to SAM.gov and check your SAM registration. And if it is not current, please update it. And then can you explain EIN for people oh. who may not have been <laughs> engaged in that yet? EIN or UEI? Sorry, UEI? Uh, so the UEI is uh, the new, uh, how do I say, you new like registration number for that we are using in government. It, it replaces the DUNS number. Uh, so you can find your UEI number on SAM.gov if you don't know what it is. Uh, but we do require UEI uh, for you to apply for a project. So you have to put your UEI number in your project applicant profile in eSnaps. Uh, and once it's in there, the project profile will pull everything into your project application. So once you put in your, your profile, you don't have to look at it again because we'll just pull it there. Great, thank you. Uh, Ebony, we have a question about project budgets here. Uh, the question is, if the grant term is for three years, do you have to spend a third of the money in year one or you end up losing it? Or how does that work exactly? Um, you, you're not, 
you're not required to spend a third of the money on year three and uh, two thirds of the money year two. So you have the, the total amount of money available for you um, for those three years. Of course, we there are the spending uh, requirements that we have, but you are not required to do a full year after uh, a one third after a full year. So there is some there is some leeway to that. Great, thank you. So uh, we're coming to the near the end of our time here. So I, I want to wrap up with a few comments here. First of all, I very much appreciate uh, the depth and breadth of comments here. Uh, if you feel like your question wasn't answered here, again, please feel free to submit it in the uh, the question box, special to cocnofo at hud.gov that you see on your screen. Um, and we will do our best to answer. We've already started answering questions. We will do our best to answer as many of those as quickly as we can. Uh, and we will try to get this recording out as quickly as possible. We do have to review the uh, chat window to make sure we didn't make any mistakes in responding to your questions. Uh, so it won't go up right away, but we will get that up as quickly as we can. I do want to remind people that uh, we are having another one of these tomorrow to talk about the unsheltered, to go into much more detail about the unsheltered portion of this NOFO. So if you're unsheltered, uh, sorry, the rural portion of this NOFO. So if your rural related questions were not answered, we will have a, you'll have a great opportunity tomorrow. So I wanna pause for a second and get a little out of the weeds and, and go back to the big picture here about this uh, NOFO. This is, a massive opportunity to address a, an inc a growing and deeply, deeply troubling problem uh, of unsheltered homelessness. We have seen that our, the number of people experiencing unsheltered number, uh, homelessness has been going up across the country quite dramatically. We know that in a lot of communities, that's not the case, that uh, people have been making progress. And we know that even in those communities where unsheltered homelessness is going up. It's not just because people have been, you know, are, are not doing a good job or not, not paying attention. Uh, we know there are a ton of factors that are contributing to this, uh, but it is a huge problem and it is something we are very much committed to addressing. And this is, uh, this is obviously a first step to that. But what we are looking for here uh, in the applications is a plan that goes beyond just how are you going to spend this money, but a plan for how your COC uh, is going to address unsheltered homelessness uh, in the, you know, going forward. Uh, we are looking for, uh, you know, bold action here. We're, we're looking for uh, people to really adopt best practices, uh, to be innovative, but mostly to really target those people who are uh, most likely to be unsheltered, who are going to use housing first practices to uh, house as many people as possible, and who are really going to leverage resources, uh, be they housing resources from your local housing authority, uh, or healthcare resources that are funded by Medicaid or through a health center or I don't know, a hospital network or however, uh, including mental health and addiction treatment and recovery supports uh, and primary health care and other, other kinds of healthcare resources. So we are really looking for game-changing kinds of uh, efforts here. This is going to be a competitive NOFO, a very competitive NOFO, particularly on the unsheltered side, uh, and it's really going to take a, a big commitment to get funded. Uh, however, the communities that get funded, I think, are really, as you can see from the appendix, are really going to be uh, getting a lot of resources. So I, I just wanted to take a moment and really uh, emphasize how important this is to us and how uh, we really, you know, see this NOFO as a way to support your efforts uh, to, to uh, turn the tide on unsheltered homelessness in the country. Uh, and we deeply appreciate that commitment you're making. Uh, and we very much look forward to the applications you submit to us. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone who joined the uh, webinar here. Very, very much want to uh, thank both our host uh, of this webinar, but uh, especially all the snappers who have been answering just a ton of questions uh, and who uh, really put just an incredible amount of effort to get this NOFO developed and published and 
uh, all the supporting resources uh, put together for everyone. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, and that concludes the webinar. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.